Legal 116. This is your podcast for weeks 15 and 16, final weeks of the 16 week Legal 116. I'm struggling this week as to how the heck a year from now I'm going to be presenting and asking students to complete this course in eight weeks. But as you may have seen or heard, a lot of the courses at Illinois Central College are being pushed towards eight-week courses, and um, except for legal research, this course and the other legal courses, a lot of our courses will be going to that format beginning in the fall. So count yourself lucky, because you know we've covered a lot of material, and I appreciate your effort, your time, and I think you will appreciate it more than I do because it'll pay off. So many, many weeks ago now, we talked about how not only civil cases, but almost anything gets to the courthouse. Majority of those things settle. We'll have family law in the spring semester. And those of you who haven't had it yet, we'll find out. And those of the, of you who have, um, no, and many of you know from personal experience, either yourself or someone close to you, that most of those cases settle. Most criminal cases plead out. So we have the courthouse, and thankfully, those things happen because there's no possible way. There aren't enough hours in the day, days in the week or the years for everything that gets filed at the courthouse to go to trial. Settlement is something that you'll learn to work up with the lawyer. It's primarily both sides arguing the value of the case. If a case settles, one or both sides has done a really good job of discovering the facts, of doing discovery, the written discovery, the depositions. You know what the issues are. You know what the realities of the facts and the potential testimony and how that's going to play out before a jury Although juries are um, not always a science. In fact, most of the time they are not. Uh, I may have shared my jury experience um, before I was two years into college, or I guess I was just finishing my second year at ICC and heading to Bradley. I served on a jury. It was a criminal case. Um, after two days of deliberations and the judge holding us over uh, past the dinner hour because he wanted to see if he couldn't force us to come to a decision, we had been um, hung. We had been we had some people that felt the individual was guilty. I was among that group. And then a couple people said that he was not. When we were held over for dinner and lunch, and the judge kept us in at lunch for some reason, and and um, we just weren't allowed to leave, we got to order food, whatever we wanted from the menu of this place that's no longer around, but used to be up on Main Street in Peoria called Phone Feast. Now, I was a college basketball player. I weighed about 175 pounds because I ran nonstop. I'm six foot five. I'm nowhere close to 175 pounds now, but back then I could eat anything and they had great food. And so I'm ordering like the half a chicken and mashed potatoes and, you know, whatever other vegetables and a piece of pie. I was in heaven. In the apartment life, I didn't have a whole lot of food in the refrigerator most times. So it was, you know, a good thing. But after two days of being held over and not being able to get home to their families, what ended up being two individuals who um, were frustrated with being held over, they said, I'm changing my vote to guilty. I'm, I need to get home to my family. And that was the reason. They didn't believe that the state had pr proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's my point. I've also shared the situation, the case I had in Bloomington civil case, car accident case, rear end car accident case, where my client admitted that she rear ended the other vehicle, but the jury came back and said they didn't like 
the, plaint the plaintiff, that the plaintiff was mean, and that they didn't believe the plaintiff. And despite the fact that my client admitted to the negligence, I won the case. She was given a not guilty by the jury. So juries can be iffy. So if we can't settle the case, um, and my feeling would be that this case would settle, but we're going to assume it didn't. We move on to trial. I asked you to read some things, um, and please do that, and please keep those things. And please refer back to those things. You won't always have access to Ickle, depending on where you go, but you have access to it now, so keep these things, and you might draw on these things later, these, these documents. Definitely know where the Illinois pattern jury instructions are. You know from our discussions early in the semester, and especially before we drafted the complaint, I said that one of the things that I recommend is when you're drafting a complaint, not only, you know, in this case, you looked at the Illinois Vehicle Code, but go look at the, the uh, pattern jury instructions for a negligence action just to see what's required in the jury instructions. The jury instructions tell us what we must prove at trial. And that's what the court will instruct the jury if the plaintiff proved these things, you must find in favor of the plaintiff. If the plaintiff did not, you must find in favor of the defendant. Okay, it's all laid out there. Nothing is a mystery. Nothing is a law and order, dun 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 situation. So, we don't have the case tried or, or settled. You may remember there's a final pretrial that the court sets when the court sets our trial date way back many months ago when the court set our trial date. When we go to this final pretrial, typically what happens is the judge gives one more effort to settle the case. If the judge can't settle the case or, or we're not able to come together to settle the case, then we move towards trial. Some realities of that. Often there are multiple cases set for trial on the same day. Um, I've seen as many as 10 or 12 cases on a judge's docket set for the same day. Now, that may sound dumb, but the reality, again, if 90% of those cases are going to settle, then you may end up with one or two and maybe one or maybe none. Every case may settle. But assuming where we are on that trial call, um, and we can check to see what cases are still active. So if we know a couple weeks before our scheduled trial date that they're, that we're number one now on the trial list, we know we're going to trial. If we're number four, we might check in with those other lawyers and find out, hey, how likely is it? If we're number four, we're probably going to get kicked down the road. And that happens. Um, but if we're able to get the number one slot, and we know we're going to try the case, the first thing that the judge is going to ask about after determining we can't settle is any issues that need to be addressed, any motions in limine, um, any other motions that a party wants to bring, and um, some judges may ask for jury instructions, propose jury instructions then. So they have those ahead of time. And, and so that's one of the reasons I had you look at this week, jury instructions. We would take these to the final pretrial. After the final pretrial, which is usually on the Friday before the Monday of the trial would start, or sometimes it's on the Monday of that trial week, and we'd start on Tuesday or maybe even Monday afternoon, depending on how quick the case was anticipated to run. And you usually are asked by the judge to give a good idea of how many days we would need. Most experienced trial lawyers would be able to agree on, you know, two, three days, depending on testimony. There's always things that come up. Um, it doesn't always work as you think, but you have a pretty good estimation. When we get to that day and time to start our jury trial, the first thing we're going to do is select our jury. 
you've probably seen examples of processes for selecting the jury, maybe served on jury duty yourself. I just got called for the seventh time in my life recently. I'm very frustrated by that because as I told you, I served back in college. Um, I've been called multiple times and they make you anybody, police, lawyers, even judges, have to go and walk through the process. There is no one that's going to pick me to sit on an actual jury. Um, but I wouldn't think anyway. But I have to go and participate in the process and go sit and waste my time like it's 1988. Listen to people argue over whether the TV channel on the ancient TVs in the room are turned to the price is right or whatever. Um, jury selection if you've never been through it, never seen it, can be tedious. Uh, again, there's some things that we would do in jury selection, depending on the lawyer you're working for. Michelle Weghorst, when she was my paralegal, if she was available because she was working for two lawyers, if we we're both on trial, she wouldn't be available. I'd like to have her in the courtroom with me, and especially during jury selection because Typically, a judge will seat four people at a time. The, the judge will ask questions, and then the lawyers will be able to ask questions. And I want to see active listening. I want to see what they say and how. I want my jurors to be fair, impartial, and engaged. I don't want them to be crazy, already decided, and bound to fall asleep. So, Michelle would take notes. She would look for those reactions. She was great because she had been a probation officer, so she was used to active listening. Once we get the jury picked, we go to opening statements. That's the first time that the defense lawyer and the plaintiff's lawyer get to talk to the jury. The plaintiff's lawyer goes first, defense lawyer goes second, and it's a statement. It is not an argument. I do not argue. I state. And I state what I plan to present in evidence. And that's what the defendant does too. The defendant can, can respond as to how they're going to counter what I present into evidence and then any evidence that they would present. Plaintiff then puts on their evidence, their witnesses, um, and any evidence the defendant, of course, gets to cross-examine those witnesses. The defendant typically will make a motion for judgment as a matter of law, uh, almost pro forma. They just do it, whether it's warranted or not. And most times it's not warranted. And uh, what that seeks or what it asks for is that the judge determine that the plaintiff has not proved their case and the defendant's entitled to a judgment as a matter of law. Again, that's typically just something that people are going to do regardless, and um, in most instances, it's not warranted. The defendant then gets to put on their evidence, any witnesses or testimony or, or evidence that they wish to introduce. And the plaintiff will probably make a motion for judgment as a matter of law. Again, that's Probably not warranted, but it's something that happens. And then there will be rebuttal, any rebuttal evidence. After the rebuttal evidence, and rebuttal evidence has to relate to evidence already put into evidence. Okay, so the plaintiff, if the defendant puts any evidence on, the, the plaintiff would be able to rebut it. Either... A party can then make a judgment as a matter of law, and they may or may not. At that point, everything's in, and we move to closing arguments. Now, as opposed to opening statements, closing arguments is an argument. I will argue why the jury should find in favor of the plaintiff and in what amount of money, and I will give a specific, you remember in the complaint, we did not give a specific dollar amount. I will give a specific dollar amount to the cent of what I'm seeking from this jury and why and why the defendant should be found guilty and the defendant is going to or the defendant's counsel is going to stand up and they're going to 
argue that I'm not entitled to anything, that my client's not entitled to anything, or whatever, the reduce it, or whatever their argument might be. They may come up and say, yes, we did this, but we think the damages are, that they're requesting are out of line. Once the defendant's done, plaintiff's counsel gets one more shot to rebut the defendant's closing argument. Jury instructions are then given. Um, as I told you, jury instructions, um, we pro have our proposed jury instructions. The defendant has their proposed jury instructions. Now, they're coming from the same sources, and so there may be some differences in wording or sometimes people choose something that you don't think applies. And if there's any dispute, typically we can just agree on what the instructions are, especially in a case as simple as ours as far as liability. And if we can't, um, the judge makes the decision. But you've read enough cases by now that you know that jury instructions are one of those appealable things or what the jury was instructed to do. It's one of those things you see appealed that the jury was misinformed or evidence was let in that shouldn't have been or something like that. In any event, the jury gets the instructions and they are sent to deliberations. If you haven't seen a courtroom, if you don't know how they're laid out, I always encourage you to go visit Peoria County courtrooms, Tazewell County courtrooms. Um, you know, sometimes you get one of these court security personnel that aren't very helpful, but typically if you tell them, um, you know, I'm taking the civil litigation class at ICC, I'm in the legal studies program, and uh, Professor Higgins said that, you know, if if there's a courtroom that you could show me or a case that's going on that I could sit in on, I'd like to sit in on it. If you ask and determine how you ask, you should be able to see things. People are typically willing to show you things in the courthouse if it's not being used and if it's not busy. Now, don't be a jerk about it. You know, again, it's in your delivery and how you ask. Most courtrooms have a small room, conference table, and enough seats for 12 jurors, and that's where the jurors deliberate. The jury deliberates, um, and hopefully they come back with a verdict, guilty or not guilty. Now, this is a, a civil case, um, so they come back with, we find the defendant guilty and damages for the plaintiff in the amount of whatever they find for damages. If that's where we go, then it goes back to the judge, and the judge records the verdict and enters a judgment. They approve the jury's finding and enter the judgment, an order that says that defendant is guilty and liable to the plaintiff in the amount of however many dollars. At that time, the defendant may renew any motions for judgment as a matter of law or any other motions, um, they may make a motion for new trial. And if there are no issues, it's done. We go to try to collect on the judgment. Now, if there's insurance, great. Um, and as I told you before, and I'll remind you again, getting a judgment is often said to be the easiest part. Now, if there's a, an insurance company or there's assets that we can get to then we can collect on the judgment. But sometimes you end up with a judgment that it's difficult to collect on. And I think I've given you some examples of those over the course of the semester. Some of the other things that I asked you to consider and, and things you'll get from the reading, but how do we get witnesses to trial? We subpoena witnesses. We subpoena witnesses and go back and remember what kind of subpoena. There's two types. One where we're seeking something or documents or access to evidence, and one where we're seeking people to be at a certain place. And then in the same Supreme Court or area of Supreme Court rules, we get a party to trial. In a civil case, now remember, I can't compel a defendant to testify in a criminal case. The state has a burden of proof. In a civil case, I can call 
the defendant to the stand. The defendant can call the plaintiff to the stand. But we got to make sure they show up. And so we use the Supreme Court Rule 237B notice. Let's talk about courtroom setup for a minute. I told you that I really encourage you to to know what a courtroom looks like if you've never been in one, and I know you've seen them on TV, and they're not a lot different, a little more elegant on TV, a little more worn, typically. Uh, There are some really cool courtrooms in some of our older older courthouse, like the main courtroom in Tazewell County. There's nothing like that in Peoria. Peoria is where the old part of the Peoria County Courthouse is from the 50s, And it looks like you would expect. Um, The new part is worse. But there are some really cool courtrooms in some of the older counties or some of the older courthouses in in smaller counties that haven't been replaced yet or knocked down for whatever reason. You really need to uh, see and think about, and the lawyer does as well, how a courtroom is set up. Before you go to try the case, uh, it's a dumb idea to be blind, go in there for the first time, you know, or even to the pretrial and see how the courtroom's set up. You should find out what's available technology wise. Now, most courtrooms, especially after COVID, are set up with, you know, screens and projectors and video and access to the internet and plenty of places to plug in computers and all that stuff. But check it out anyway. You'd also want to know, you know, where's the judge's bench? Which side of the judge's bench is the witness box on? Where is the witness box in relation to the jury box? And typically we want the witness box to be on the same side of the room as the jury box, the same side of the judge's bench as the jury box. Where are the counsel tables and how are they set up? Are they set up facing the jury box? Are they facing the judge? Can you move them? How how accommodating is the judge? There's some judges that, you know, if you ask and it's reasonable and the other counsel agrees, we'll let you do a lot of things. Within reason. I'm not saying do backflips across the courtroom, move all the equipment to the side, but within reason. There are other judges. There was a judge in McLean County um, in the dead of winter. You walk in there with your coat on and you go to put your coat somewhere and, you know, don't hang it on the bench on the on or don't hang it on the chair in the um, at the council table. Don't drape it over. A lot of times in the winter, you see lawyers come in, especially if there's multiple lawyers in the room. They drape it over the bar. There's a a rail or a bar or some places it looks like a picket fence going between the gallery area and then where the lawyers and the parties and the court personnel go. That's the bar. Don't put it on the bar. What am I supposed to do with it? Hold it in my lap for three days of trial? Um, there was a judge who didn't let you put your, at any time, even to unload it. You couldn't put your, your briefcase or your case with all your trial materials or your computer or whatever on the table to unload it. Um, Sometimes they're not as accommodating, but you should know that or your lawyer should know that before you ever get to the courthouse on that day. It's important to know where these things are and how it's set up because you're going to consider, and I've asked you to do that with this assignment, what evidence are we going to present? How are we going to present it? Is it going to be electronic? Okay, well, if it's electronic, where is the projector in relation to the jury box. Typically, the projection area or the TV or the, the screen or whatever is going to be across from the jury box where the jurors can see it. All right, that's great. We want the jurors to see that. We also want the jurors to hear the lawyer. So where is a lawyer going to stand so they can have the witness respond, have the jury 
hear them, have the jury see both the witness and them and the screen. And then I always wanted to stand in a place where my witness was forced to look at the jury. Um, So one of my tricks was to position myself, if the judge would let me, over uh, to the side of the jury box, the far end of the jury box. So I was looking like the jury towards the witness, and the witness was looking towards the jury while they were looking at me to respond or to talk to me or to answer my questions. It keeps people engaged. Little things like that. So it's important that you know what the courtroom looks like. You as well, because guess what? You're going to be running back and forth to the courtroom. You're going to be helping the lawyer get the courtroom set up. You're going to be doing things like audiovisual and technical support and coordinating people. Um, you know, a paralegal legal assistant typically, if they're involved in litigation and they're involved on trial days, they're going to be making sure that witnesses get there on time. I don't want my witnesses showing up on Tuesday at 10 o'clock if I don't expect them to testify until afternoon on Wednesday. And then if I know that things got pushed back because the judge had to go to the dentist or whatever it was, always happens. If I know that they're not going to testify until three o'clock, I don't want them to show up until two o'clock. When they show up at two o'clock, I want you to make sure that they get to the to the place they're supposed to be, either sitting outside the courtroom or in the witness room or however the court's set up. You're going to do that, okay? These are all things that you have to consider as a litigation legal assistant or paralegal, or for those of you going to law school, you'll think about these things and a lot more. There's a lot involved. That's why I want you to pay serious attention over these next couple weeks to not only the deadlines, but the trial prep ickle materials, the trial preparation checklist, and the Illinois Pattern Jury Instructions. Spend time with these things, please. For you, not me. And again, pay attention to the deadlines. They're different. And we're covering, you know, all of this in two weeks, so you have plenty of time. If you use the time, you do what you're supposed to do, and you pay attention to the deadlines. I really appreciate your efforts this semester. I hope you stay well. If you have any questions about the class, careers, internships, jobs I've posted, um, the program, whatever, you know where to find me, right? Stay well, have a good break, and happy holidays.